One farmer says, seems to me there was a tea party in Boston that was illegal too. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold. We shall seek to establish and maintain a dollar which will not change its purchasing and debt-paying power during the succeeding generation. As anguished shrieks rose up from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Government credit and government currency are really one and the same thing. A reserve of gold and a small reserve of silver. Why do central banks hold it? Well, it's, it's a form of reserves. So why don't they hold diamonds? Well, it's tradition, long-term <laughs> tradition. You know, some people still think it's money. Hey, good evening, and welcome back to the absolutely most boring channel on the YouTube, the Junius Malpe channel. Today, we're going to take a look at the case for $5,000 gold. It's one of those far-fetched, outlandish calls. It's made its way into the news a few times, and then uh, we looked at the Gold Outlook 2020. We really didn't touch on five and $10,000 gold, but every once in a while, you run across those articles and those calls and people trying to make the case for it. It somewhat is believable. You know, you can see that scenario playing out. However, when is always the big question. When could that be? We're going to look at that article, but we're also going to look at some contributing factors, some symptoms that are showing up in the economy, things that could make it be a, a, make it become a reality. The image on the screen now, the volcano of fiat exploding and covering the earth, in the ash plume of rotting Federal Reserve notes. You can see that there as being a case for, yes, $5,000 gold. But let's take a look now. I know I saw a video earlier uh, by Rick Santelli discussing the Fed and the repo markets, raising some good points, uh, as usual, discussing those things and what's taking place with the Fed and their unending issuance of basically quantitative easing, QE. $5,000 gold. Analysts bullish for the decade ahead. This comes from Kitco News. Again, it's three weeks old, but I dug it up and thought it relevant anyways. You know, gold is so timeless and so ancient that the timeline, when you're looking at gold and its role in the economy, an article that is three weeks old really is not that dated. On the, on the, in the big scheme of things, and if you put it into the timeline we're in, it's fairly recent. You know, three weeks, it's nothing. It's from Tuesday, December 31st, and this is from Alan Sakura. Again, this is a Kitco News article. The editor's note there reads that 2020 is expected to be another year of significant uncertainty and turmoil. The question is, what asset will emerge the victor when the dust settles from the global trade war, Brexit, recession threats, negative bond yields? It's a showdown of global proportions, so don't miss all our exclusive coverage on how these factors could impact your 2020 investment decisions. And think there's been a lot of news that has occurred since then. You know, we've seen the Iranian scare. We've seen now this whacked out patented flu situation. Uh, a lot. The, the repo market, of course, that took place in September. We'll get a little bit more into that. But th there's a lot of different things taking place that are shaping up to make 2020 <laughs> an interesting year. Again, it's an election year also, so keep that in mind. We've got that to deal with. We've got uh, these rabid little communists running all over the United States now uh, looking to buy their first AKs and get some training and maybe put their joint down for a little while so they can engage in their class warfare that they seem to be calling for. So yeah, that's that's a contributing factor to uh, the, I guess, some tailwind, if you will, for gold. Now this is the excerpt I chose for this article. I didn't want to get into the entirety of it. There was a lot of other discussion that really didn't fit or pertain to us here that I wanted to bring up. And this Holmes gold is probably going to $5,000. That's the, the main point here. Holmes suggested unprecedented money printing, okay, unprecedented money printing that is happening, will continue. This refers to ultra loose monetary policy undertaken by central banks to flood the economy with money. Fiscal stimulus is harder to implement since it has to work its way through different layers and branches of government. It's much easier for central banks to print money, said the CEO of U.S. Global Investors. And as long as that takes place with no checks and controls, 
then it could go to $10,000. So he's not only calling for $5,000, this guy's talking about $10,000 gold. And that, you know, it makes the hair stand up on the back of some people's necks. It also causes some people to roll their eyes. Everyone has their own unique reaction to calls like five or $10,000 gold. I myself have my own reactions to it. And usually it's more like a little tingling sensation, I guess you could say, and excitement. Holmes characterized the G20 industrialized nations as an OPEC-like cartel, printing money. This is especially the case with fewer major currencies since the advent of the euro, replacing most of the individual European currencies. Against this backdrop, all of a sudden, it's much easier to print money excessively, Holmes said. Besides low short-term interest rates, there also have been several rounds of quantitative easing in which central banks buy bonds to push down long-term interest rates. And remember, they're looking to do even negative interest rates, and they're going to continue printing and buying these bonds and doing this QE and these bailouts, and we'll look some more at that. It's an incredible backdrop for gold because it's much easier to print a trillion repo in U.S. dollars than it is ever going to be to produce one trillion in gold bullion, he said. It takes a long time to produce gold, so it's going to retain that value. Holmes compared central banks' constant money printing to the dopamine rush that leads to alcoholism. Absolutely, some have even equated it to uh, uh, heroin. You know, these, these central bankers keep injecting the economy with this needle, and eventually there's going to be a tremendous hangover. And that, that's an interesting point I want to bring up. We've talked about what it takes to get gold out of the ground. We've had lengthy discussions on this channel, the costs that it, uh, are involved in mining and extracting gold, producing gold. We've mentioned here time and time again, depending on the value or how much gold is, quote, worth in U.S. dollars, depends on the total value of the, uh, the sum of all gold ever mined since the beginning of time. And it's always interesting to bring that number into play when you're talking about all of the different asset classes and commodities out there and the size of, of the economy, how much money's in circulation when you look like M1, M0, M2, M3, the money supply, or you look at uh, you know the entire value of the Dow or the NASDAQ or the S&P, the total value, or even like, you know, the market cap, the market cap of, let's say, even cryptocurrencies, which is, I don't even know, today it could be 200 billion or something, 250, 280. To get a trillion dollars printed, they could do that probably with all the printing presses in the U.S. I don't know, maybe a day or two. Who knows what it takes, how long they get them going. Heck, they just digitize it on a screen, right? What it would take to get a trillion dollars in gold, however, is a much different story. And I want you to pause on this screen. I know this is, again, it's boring. There's words on the screen and you hear this droning, boring voice passing on this information. But think for one second what it takes to create, or to not create, but to make physical and purify and refine and have before you one trillion dollars of glimmering gold London good delivery bars. Okay, now, that, now keep in mind, there's only been approximately five trillion, five to six trillion dollars worth of gold ever mined in history since the first man plucked a glimmering plaster nugget from a stream. So if you add up all the gold ever mined since the beginning of time till now, that's sitting there refined in a state of metal, okay, it's about five to six trillion dollars. So one fifth of all the gold ever mined, what it would take to create that again right now to just out of thin air have it exist as if they as they do with fiat currency that right there is a synopsis on why gold will retain and hold value and go up because these people these madmen at the helm of the economy have no issue no problem creating fiat that quickly and we all know the way economics works it's much simpler than these little guys in suits with chalk stains on their sleeves and frizzy hair and spectacles that you know, call themselves professors of economics. It's much simpler than they like to put it. You know, the supply-demand curves and all of that and all of that. We know that the more money they print, a large part of it is going to find its way into certain areas and certain arenas of the economy. 
It's going to chase bonds. It's going to chase equities. It's going to chase real estate. As those trillions of dollars are, are put into play into the system and injected into it, they're going to trickle through it. And the more of them out there that there are, well, now you have competition for gold. You have more and more and more and more greenbacks, Federal Reserve notes, little bills with Benjamin Franklin on them, chasing a somewhat fixed and constant supply of physical gold. That competition, those extra bills out there chasing that gold will drive the price up. So keep that in mind. That is the main driving point. And again, it's not that gold is going up in value. I know a lot of people like to get on that and harp on that point. If I, if I mention it, they're like, hey, gold's not going up in value. It just takes more dollars to buy it. I get that. Believe me. That is a very clear point. It is understood. It just so happens that it's easier to, in using our language and words, to say gold's going up in value or it, it costs more. It, it's increasing in price because of the increase in the money's supply. So keep that in mind. $5,000, $10,000 gold, trillion dollars, out of nowhere, out of thin air. Let's look at some more. Now, real quick, let's take a look at where gold is at. Okay, we've got this five-year chart, fresh, hot off the press. Gold sitting at 1571.30, up 590 today, up about a third of a percent, 0.37% there. Now look at the bottoms. Bottom, bottom, bottom. You got the one in 2016, the one in 2017. You've got one in about July. All of the bottoms are higher than the previous bottom on this chart. The highs look like they're almost getting a little bit higher there up until about July. And then it just takes off. And that's where we see it really pop. You know, that's when gold really rocketed through $1,300, $1,400, and then $1,500 an ounce in a very short span of time. And now it's sitting above 1500 it touched on and kissed the 16 mark early in this year 2020 so gold sitting at 157130 on the backdrop of what's going on geopolitically and economically and the repo markets and all that is setting up it has a pretty good platform it's set up to really jump from here if you look at what some of these experts are saying I mean, we've already seen $2000 calls as being some of the conservative and sober calls for gold going forward. So sitting at 1570, and all you have to do again, I'll remind you when we look back at where we were in, in 2007 and 8, or the early 2000s when everything was building up to that point, look at where gold was then and how quickly it reacted in spite of the fact that they were pulling all of their safety stops to try to resurrect a dying marketplace. And then, of course, gold stabilized, and these guys were able to, you know, stave off disaster. However, they just, remember, they just put a Band-Aid on it, or they stuck their thumb in the dike to keep that, that deluge of destruction at bay. And again, looking at gold just on a one-year chart, looking back to about February of last year to now, very healthy, very strong, you know, higher lows, higher highs, setting up there very strong going into this year 2020. And yes, my little silver buddies, I too am a holder of silver. So let's take a look at that. The little brother of gold, it will follow along for the ride. It's going to, as usual, you know, kind of follow in the footsteps of its big brother and we've got silver once again over that 18 mark. It's been a battle for $18. We finally broke it again. It's up 29 cents today, up 1.63%. So a pretty good, that's a pretty good silver day, 1.63%, sitting at 1812. It's a good number, war of 1812. But again, silver always has that chaotic chart, in my opinion. It just, you know, you look at this one year chart and it's somewhat erratic. It really, it, it's not, it doesn't look as strong sometimes, you know, it's got that strong peak there, then it drops off to the right and you've got lower lows, lower highs, uh, diving towards December. And then it kind of picked itself up by the bootstraps. And now it's back, you know, battling it out for that 18 range. We'll see what happens. Uh, I'm assuming and guessing here going out on a limb that if gold continues its bullish runs, that silver will follow suit. You know, people, a lot of people that buy gold you know, for the right reasons will also be buyers of 
silver. It is being vaulted. There are people buying large amounts of it. And there are people that uh, agree, It's I, I, and I'm one of them, that it is one of the, you know, 70th century monetary units of exchange. It's, it's just like gold in that fact. You know, it's been around for 7,000 years. It's been money. It's been coin. It is used for the payments of debts and services, goods and services. Uh, it extinguishes debt very well. And, uh, you know, there's a reason we had strategic stockpiles of it. It also has many good applications in the industrial world and, uh, you know, uses. You know, just like gold has uses for circuitry and things, silver, we all know, has strong uses and applications. But what we're looking at here is how it's going to react to this ever-increasing supply of money. Bonds look like they are flashing a warning for global markets. A key interest rate is moving to levels last seen in the fall when markets were worried about trade wars. Treasury yields have defied expectations so far this year, and the yield on the benchmark 10-year is the lowest level since November 1. The 10-year is important since its rate influences mortgages and other loans, and when its yield moves lower, it can reflect worry about the economy and other fears like the current uncertainty about the potential severity of the new coronavirus. I'm not too worried about it. Strategists said the yield could continue to move lower until the impact of the virus becomes more clear, and with help from the easy policies of the Fed and other central banks. The yield at 1.68% was at 1.83% last Friday and has seen its biggest one-week move since November. But here's where we're going to talk about the Federal Reserve repo market. Look at how much money they're adding. You know, there's these articles out there, $74.2 billion, the liquidity operations. Uh, we've got this Fed adding over $90 billion in temporary money to the markets. The Fed pumping $500 billion into the repo market. Where does it end? Where does it end? $500 billion, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to skip to the third paragraph with me. When the Federal Reserve began offering these daily agreements in late September 2019, it was the first time it has intervened in repo markets since the Great Recession. Red flag. The United States Central Bank has funneled roughly $500 billion, so half a trillion, into the repo market since then. So since September, this has been going on. Think of how much money that is just since September. It's staggering, and I can't believe it's not getting more attention than it is. So since then, in what was originally pitched as temporary operations that would end on October 10th, but they haven't stopped, but the daily repo bids are still coming. Currently, there is $229 billion in outstanding repos on the Fed's balance sheet. The Fed is even considering lending directly to smaller financial institutions and hedge funds through the repo market, an unprecedented move in the history of the century-old institution. With the Fed gripping the reins of this obscure but essential sector of the U.S. financial realm for the first time since the 2007-2008 financial crisis, should the average American be anxious about the state of the U.S. financial market? The answer to that would be yes, and I don't think it only pertains to the average American. I think this is a global concern. Again, this is the world reserve currency. And the way the U.S. economy goes, likely a lot of the other economies are going to go with it, as we saw in the 2007-2008 financial crisis. that A lot of people blamed on mortgage-backed securities failing here in the U.S. And that rippled through economies around the world. The headlines abound regarding what the Fed's actions are and what their intent is. We've seen it. Their, their motive, their actions, all forms of money supply have accelerated over the past year. And that's what's supporting the stock market and lofty equity prices. The Federal Reserve is stuck in quantitative easing hell. They've basically begun performing an act that they cannot stop. Because if they do, it's just allowing the system to crumble, which they refuse to do, or they don't want it to be able to rightly correct itself. They don't want the free market to be able to work. They want to keep supporting, you know, crappy equities 
and stocks that shouldn't have the value that they have. So they just keep pumping money into it because people expect, they have this entitlement and expectation of perpetual growth. Whether it's pension funds or investment portfolios, everyone expects a certain gain and that there is no malinvestment, that nothing can go bad or deteriorate. And it's created an environment that allows for this type of behavior. Well, there's a consequence to it, whether or not they will allow that consequence to occur now or later. The later they allow it to occur, the harsher it will be. That consequence is going to be the deterioration and the lack of faith, the failing faith, in the world reserve currency, in the U.S. dollar. It's inevitable. It's funny to me how you'll have analysts financial experts, people in the news, professors, you name it, speak somewhat disparagingly or um, condescendingly about economies that inflated currency to do things, to perform a certain way. They look at Weimar Germany as being, oh, you know, they did this wrong, they did that wrong, they shouldn't have done that. Or they'll talk about the boulevard, like we saw recently in South America. And we've seen them discuss these very things with, not only with Argentina and Venezuela, but now we're look, let's look over across over in Africa with the world record bill that I hold, the Zimbabwe note, the $100 trillion note. And everyone talks so poorly about the inflation there, the hyperinflation that occurred with that note. Well, the only difference between that note and a euro is the pictures on it. Because we've covered that on the channel as well. They come from the exact same printing house. Those bills and euro bills are printed by the same people. It's just what country they represent. What monetary unit they represent. Neither one is backed by anything. Both have images on them. Both are essentially inflated by bankers and people that are at the helm controlling these world economies. So I, I would challenge anyone to really, you know, declare the difference between the two. Metal doesn't have that problem. You know, silver and gold don't have anything in common with a Federal Reserve note, with a Zimbabwe note, with a Bolivar, with a peso, with a yen, a yuan, or a renminbi. No, gold and silver are their own. They answer to no man and to no government. And that's essentially why governments tend to dislike them because they don't do their bidding and they don't listen to them when they say that the price should be this. I mean, think of it right here, right now in the United States. The United States is, by golly, gold is $42 an ounce. Well, no, it's not. You can call it that. You can say it is officially on the government books that it's $42 an ounce. But, uh, yeah, and that raises an interesting question. I'd love to offer to buy the gold from the federal government for $42 an ounce. And it's also interesting if they declare it on the books as being $42 an ounce. Why is it that when you go on the U.S. Mint to buy bullion, they're selling it to you for $1,600 an ounce? That's an interesting thought. I've never considered someone filing a lawsuit against the U.S. government or the U.S. Mint saying that you declare, your institution declares it as only being $42 an ounce, but you're selling it to me for $1,600. I'd like to buy it for $42 an ounce because that's what you say it's worth. That's what the government says the gold is worth, by golly, right? <laughs> it's interesting. It's an interesting, uh, I've always thought that, you know, it's typical government, you know, say it's worth this, sell it for that, say it's worth this, but deep down inside they know it's not. And yet all their actions continue to drive the price further and further and further and further away from $42 an ounce. And now we are looking at predictions of five and ten thousand dollars an ounce. That's the original intent and topic of this video, being five or ten thousand dollar an ounce gold. We just took a look at what they're doing in the repo world. It shows no signs of stopping. Five hundred billion dollars since September injected into the economy. They're going to keep doing it. It's happening every single day and week. They're destroying interest rates. It's uh, wreaking havoc in the bond market. And now we're going to see uh, eventually equities suffer because they're going to stop injecting this heroin, this alcohol, and the party has to come to an end. The music has to stop at some time. And as we've used that analogy in the past of musical chairs, 
when the music does stop, you're going to want to have a chair to sit down in. And most financial institutions have a gold chair. That's why they're vaulting gold. That's where they're buying gold. That's where they're going to sit. That's where they're going to sit this out when the music stops. And that's another driving force for gold. These guys in suits know what's coming. They can see the writing on the wall. And they know that the music is coming to its end. And when it does, the dance is going to stop. And everyone's going to scramble to sit in a chair. And if you turn around as a major financial institution, a banker, or an investor, and you don't have a chair to sit down in, you lose the game. you got to go stand by the wall, and you're no longer participating. And that chair is, again, to remind you, is gold. It's musical chairs, ladies and gentlemen. And the music is coming to an end. I don't know when. No one does. I'm not an expert by any means. All I do is report this information as I find it and digest it just like you do. And then ponder the, uh, the interesting thoughts regarding it. So there you have it. That's today's discussion. Is $10,000 gold coming within this decade? Between 2020 and 2030, I think it's likely. I think it's very possible. It's not that big of a leap. If it went from $200, and $56 to almost $1,900. Think of that. $256 to $1,900. In just a span, oh, what was that? About 11 years, 10 years. It could easily go from $1,500, $1,600 to $10,000. It wouldn't take too much. It wouldn't take too much to do that. So, yes, $5,000 is Highly possible, highly likely. Again, that's just to go to 5000 not a big deal. You're talking about $3,500 from here. Not that much of a multiplication when you look at what gold's done in the past, percentage-wise, as it reacted to very similar events. And these events that we're facing now are, in a way, far worse, far more dramatic, much more extreme than what we saw during those years. All right. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and pop comments down below and participate in the conversation here on the Junior Small Channel.